I'd like to in introduce myself and maybe the, some of the presenters as well. Our topic for today, data-driven profits. I'm pretty excited about this one. Um, I was never a numbers man when I was a kid, but what I realized is running a business is all about the numbers. Hmm. And um, when we know exactly what numbers to be looking at, um, we can actually grow the business quite quickly and quite effectively. So a little bit about my background. Uh, my name's David Guest. For those who I haven't met, I, I run a company called Outcomes Business Group. I started this company literally 20 years ago this month. Um, in 2001. Um, and our, our business is simple. We, uh, we're a business coaching firm. We started when business coaching was a bit of a foreign name. But um, when I was asked exactly what do we do, um, we help people uh, who are in business and are not getting where they want to go. And it sort of started with my history. I used to work with my parents. My parents were immigrants into the country. Has anyone worked in the family business on this call? Can I get a show of hands for those people? Yeah, there's a few in the awesome. Um, I was five years old and I, I worked out they were only paying me because it was cheaper than a babysitter to sit there and help them in their business. But um, the thing that happened is my parents used to say to me, you know, we're working hard in this business because we can't get a job as a professional so that you can go to school and you can become a professional. You can become whatever you like, a doctor or a lawyer, right? That was the options in those days, right? And unfortunately, I was really bad academically. I didn't make it. Um, but I had a question in my mind and I said, why is it some people in business make a lot of money and other people in business don't make a lot of money and they work really hard? And what I realized is that if I asked the question of you guys on the call today, of why did you go into business? I'm curious, actually, I might get you to do this into the chat box. For those people who run their own business, why did you go into business in one word? Just into the chat box. Why did you go into business in one word? Uh, freedom, had a dream, control, uh, having more fun, control, family, awesome opportunity see here's the two most most frequent things that people respond the first one is freedom so i can get to choose my own hours and the second one is so that i can choose my own paycheck now i'm curious for those people who have been in business for over five years on the call um who's been in business over five years can i just get a quick show of hands for this okay there's quite a few um so tell me if this is true you work harder than you ever would for anyone else and some months you get paid less than is legal Right? Yeah, there's some nods going on. So the reality is the dream is valid, right? The dream is valid. And I think what happens is we get railroaded and it's a bit like a four-year-old taking a great day in for a walk. The question is who's walking who? Um, so when we talk about reinvigorating the business dream, the whole idea is to go back to why you went into business in the first place and build the business that you decided. Now, looking at businesses that I speak to, so in the last 20 years, we've had lots of conversations with business owners and this is what I see, right? I see my first question is, how's business going? And they say, we are busy, we are flat out. Now, to me, being busy doesn't mean anything, right? It literally just me, it's, it's just telling me what's going on. And usually they're running around running the business and I get that. And they do their admin and they only do a bit of admin and they usually do it after hours. And the funny thing is that when we talk about marketing, they say, we don't need to market. Most of our business comes from word of mouth or referral. Now, who's in that boat? Most of your business comes from word of mouth or referral. Yeah, nearly half of the people on the call. And when I thought about this, I said, well, why wouldn't you market your business? And the reality is it's not because they don't want to. It's because they can't. And the reason they can't is because they're stuck in the middle. And if I said to those people, well, we want to double your business over the next 12 months, they would freak out. Because if I'm doing 70 hours a week already, and I want to double that business, chances are I'm going to have to work 140. So for most people, the reason they don't market their business is not because all their business comes from word of mouth or referrals, it's because of capacity. So the ideal business looks a bit more like this, right? So there's operations, there's admin, and there's marketing, and they're all in equal proportion. But here's the biggest distinction, right? The person running the business should be not part of day-to-day -day operation. They should be working on the business, not in the business. Now, it's easy to say, hard to do. All right. Now, when we talk about data-driven profits today, and we're talking about how do I grow my business, it's all about focusing on the numbers rather than focusing on the activity. So let's have a look at how this looks. Um, one thing, and you probably need to jot this one down, is the numbers in your business don't lie. So when someone says to me, my business is flat out, it means nothing. My next question is, are you profitable? Not what's your revenue, are you profitable? And the standard answer to that is, I don't know. I don't know if I'm profitable, which scares me, right? Because if you don't know if you're profitable, how do you know what you need to be doing? Now, all of us have a Speedo in our car, right? Is the Speedo an important instrument? Yes or no? Just yes, not if you think it is, right? Now, let me ask you, why is it important? Why is it important? 
Um, and, and the short answer is this. If I ask the question, most people say, because I don't want to get a speeding ticket. Yeah. Now, it's an interesting answer, but it's true, right? People say, I don't want to get a speeding ticket. That's why the speed is important. So if the speed limit is 60, then I know how fast I'm going in comparison to the limit. Now, if I said to you, there's no speed limit, does the speedo, is the speedo still important? And the answer would be, some people say, oh, it's a safety feature. Other people say, it tells me how fast I'm going. Why is that important? So that I don't drive recklessly. And I think driving reckless and the speed aren't directly related, right? You drive at a safe speed. So what happens is no speed limit and less reliance on the speedo. Now in business, how this appears is when most people don't know their numbers. Don't know their numbers. Um, and so what we talk about is, uh, you know, no speed limit, no relevance of the speedo. Now, when I ask people about the profitability of their business, um, someone said to me one day, our business is generating 50K of profit. Now, I can't tell you if that's good, good bad or indifferent unless I know what the target is. Because if I'm BHP, that's terrible. And if I'm a startup, it's awesome. So we need to have a budget, we need to have a target, and then all of a sudden the numbers become super meaningful. In today's presentation, we're going to be talking about a lot of numbers, but we're going to be talking about the three pillars of the numbers you should be measuring in business. So the very first one, which is the bottom line, some people call it, which is the profit. And we talk about in business, we talk about collections. There's an old saying, in business, cash flow is king. And what I mean by that is, that I don't care what business you're in, you need to keep the cash flowing. Now, someone talked about what about sales in the chat box. I would put sales into the marketing arena. Sales and marketing is really about generating new business. And that's what I would consider being the, the track. Okay? So we need to get new clients in the door. Now, if you're self-employed or if you're in the center of the business, getting new clients in the door is not something that you want too much of because you've got a capacity issue. So attraction should be a flywheel in your business. It should be something that's working all the time. So sales and marketing should be something that you are measuring with numbers, but you're also investing in as well. Now you'll notice I said, invest, not spend, right? So you should be investing in your marketing, which means it carries a return. And the third part of this equation is delivery. And when I say delivery, what I mean is you should be delivering your product or service profitably, all right, and efficiently, which means that you get new clients, you deliver the product or service and you get the cash. Now, if you do those three things effectively in your business, you will make money. And the trick is to move yourself out of the center of the universe and make sure that this is happening within the business while you are managing the building of the business. Is this making sense for everyone? Not if you're with me. And we're going to go through these three components today. I'm pretty excited about our presenter lineup because uh, what we've got is we've got one expert in each one of those areas. The first one I want to talk about, and I think it's probably the most important one, is the collections. Because in the end, if money doesn't come in, you're not in business. And when we talk about, you know, the, there's an old saying, you know, revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, but cash flow is king. And when we talk about the money in business, the very first thing I ask people to do is tighten up on their cash flow, make sure the cash is coming in. So I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Tony Rule from Tag Financial. Now, Tony, I've known for a fair while. He's an awesome accountant. Uh, apparently, he's really good at Tetris too and packing stuff in his car. But the reality is when it comes to understanding the structures that you need in your business, the financial arrangement that you need to make sure you're optimizing your cash return and optimizing your tax, um, you really need to get some expert advice. So I've invited Tony today to talk about how we use the data from the financial side to optimize our business. So welcome to the call, Tony. You'll need to unmute, unmute yourself. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. I'll, um... I'll, I'll jump in and uh, have a go at sharing my screen. So, um, yeah, so Tony Rule, I'm a partner at Tag Financial Services. Um, I've been uh, looking after small and medium sized businesses for about 30 years. So, uh, just bear with me while I get this. Okay, we should all be able to uh, uh, see my presentation now. So yeah, 30 years looking after small and medium sized business. I, I ask myself, well, why is that? I, I really enjoy um, working with people and I also love solving problems. And so those two things, you know, most people uh, who have a business have at least one problem. And so um, I, I have the privilege of working with people to, uh, to uh, solve uh, and, and uh, make things better. Uh, my business, uh, Tag Financial Services, we're coming up to 20, 25 years in business. We've got approximately 45 employees. Uh, we're in the top four, uh, 75 accounting practices in Australia. 
And um, look, we, we just love doing what we're doing and, and getting results for clients. Uh, there's a lot of numbers in business. Um, and, and really my, my presentation today is about making sure you're focusing on the right ones to, to get the, um, the result that you deserve. And, and my challenge today is um, I want you all to get what you deserve from your business. Okay, uh, let me just... All right, so quick disclaimer. Um, the advice in this presentation is general in nature. Clearly, it's not tailored to each person's personal circumstances. And, and the key message is when you need professional advice, get professional advice. Okay, right, business owners. Often business owners work the hardest, and this, this reiterates what Dave's just been saying, take all the risks and get paid the least and after everyone else. And really the focus should be on making your business better for yourself, all right? Um, why would anyone want to be a business owner? Um, future, um, you know, really, you know, future business owners would be looking at the current level of business owners and sort of saying, with all that hard work and with all the risks they're taking and, and you know, don't worry, they're doing calculations on how profitable you are. They're looking at it and saying, why would I want to become a business owner? As a group of business owners right here, right now, we need to be doing a much better job in getting a result for ourselves, but also to um, setting an example for the next group to come through. And don't forget those people that are watching us right at this point in time, they're the future buyers of our business, whether we like it or not. So we've got to make it look great and it's got to be great. And, and that's, what we, that's what we should be getting out of our business. All right. Um, David asked the question about why would we get into business in the first instance. We all had dreams about, you know, making heaps of money or being in control or not having a boss or wanting to change the world. That's all fantastic. But, but often what I see with business owners is those dreams start to fade away after years in business and they just get into a situation where they're just turning up. Um, so, you know, hopefully you don't all relate to that, but um, sadly, that's that's what seems to be happening. All right. So we spoke about taking all the risks, the business owners taking all the business, the business owners taking all the risks. So small business owners, 55 percent will retire poor, 74 percent have no retirement plan, 54 percent have no succession plan and 26 percent will need a government pension when they retire. All right. Um, I do not know a single business owner that's doing it easy, okay? They work hard, and as I said, th they deserve a, a proper result. So, um, and, the, and the risks that we're sort of talking about are real, right? You, you put your home on the line to, to secure um, bank finance. You're, you, you, you're taking your savings and you're putting your savings into the business, and, and you're making an investment in your business, and that's all at risk. So the interesting thing is that in all of this, some business owners do make a profit. Some business owners don't make a profit, okay? So is that just luck or is there something else at play? All right, so, you know, having, having been in business for 30 years, I've, I've seen all sorts of situations. And, and the big question that, that struck me for a number of years is, how can two players in the same industry have a different result. Surely if you're in the same industry, you all should be getting the same level of profit. Um, and you know what, what you'll see, or what I've come to see is in any industry and in every industry, there are some, there are some businesses that will be getting poor performance and some businesses that will be getting really strong performance. And then a whole heap of businesses stuck in the middle. Okay. And as part of that, well, you, you've got to ask yourself, well, are you improving? Are you declining? Or are you standing still? And if you're standing still and everybody else is improving, you're, you're going to be drifting towards the losses end of this scale. Okay. Um, in terms of, you know, right here, right now, you know, I think I heard this morning, 13.5 million people in lockdown. Okay. I'm very conscious of as everybody is of the, the current situation with the economy, all right? Um, if you're in travel, entertainment, venues, uh, you've been hit really hard. And look, I know there's a lot of businesses that are, that are really struggling out there. Sales are down and profit are down, 
okay? But for most of the businesses that I see, sales are down, but profit is up or stable. And, and that's because of the, the job keeper effect from last year. So what that's really doing is um, masking. I, I see a lot of people that are quite relaxed about the current situation. And, and my fear for them is that, you know, there's been a whole heap of job keeper that's come into their business that is masking their actual performance. And so, you know, what you know, what I'm here to, 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 to make sure is, well, JobKeeper's not here next year or the year after or the year after that. We need to take action now to get the best possible result. And if that's taking a loss situation, turning into a small profit, let's do that. That's what we're doing. If it's a small profit, let's turn that into a, a large profit, okay? And this can all be achieved. I know it's a tough time, but this can be achieved and we've, we've got to focus on making sure that's occurring. Okay, I want to talk about, um, the, you know, everybody's got their own um, uh, framework. We talk about eight steps to success. Today, we're going to really focus on points two and three, but I just want to go through this from a, to give people some context, okay? So the first step is to understand your goals and objectives and to keep them front of mind. It's really surprising the, the number of times I meet with a client and say, well, what are your goals and objectives? What are you trying to achieve? And, and, they, and they sit there. And, um, you know, and it's, it's really important as an advisor and as, you know, you know, my role is to help people achieve what they want to achieve. So to be half a chance, I need to understand what they want to achieve. Um, so, but it really surprises the number of times I get a, a blank look from a business owner because they, they can't articulate their goals and objectives. So you've got to be really clear on that as a, as a starting point. Step number two is, is making sure that um, you have a business budget and you pay yourself first, all right? And I'll, we'll go through that in a bit more detail in a minute. The third point is understanding the data in your business to build and develop the business. And Kale and Damien will be talking about those things very shortly. So I'm not gonna jump into that area too much other than to say, get the right people around you at the right times to make the right decisions, okay? Uh, the fourth point is a quarterly board meeting. The, the number of businesses that do not, or business owners that do not stop and think of, take themselves out, out of the business and think about the performance of their business, it is staggering, okay? If you, if you do nothing else from this presentation, just stop once, once a quarter, once a month, you pick the time frame but stop and think about whether your business is giving you what you strive for in your goals and objectives. Fifth point, build a powerful fighting fund for strength, wealth, and retirement. What's a fighting fund? A fighting fund is a pile of cash, okay? There's a lot of bad things that happen in business. Key employees leave, um, key customers leave, suppliers put up their prices, all sorts of things, got the coronavirus, all sorts of things. If you've got a, a large amount of money sitting in your bank account, you can cope with anything. Money in your bank account buys you time. Money in your bank account makes you feel powerful. If, you know, one of the key messages that I want to get through to you guys today is mindset is everything. So trick yourself into a position of power by having a, 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 a strong cash balance sitting inside the business. All right. So well, I won't talk too much more about that, but that's point five. Point six, Continually systemize the business and train your team. And I'm sure this is what, um, you know, David and um, his team would be talking to you guys about as well. So, you know, whenever you learn something new about your business, turn it into a system, okay? And then, and then train your team and then delegate it, right? You, you're, you're not the best at everything that goes on in your business, right? So, so basically just get, get the team doing what they need to be doing as quickly as possible. Um, that ties with point number seven, diversify your team away, diversify yourself away from the business. So make sure that you're getting, um, you, know, put, you know, work leverage down to the people that need to be doing that work. And the, the final point is get the right structure for each stage of your business. And, and you know, as an accountant, I've got to throw this one in. I see um, every second set of accounts I look at um, from, you know, people I'm talking to out and about, um, they're in the wrong structure. They're paying way too much tax. They're taking way too much risk. There's not enough asset protection going on. So for heaven's sake, 
speak to somebody every, if it's not every second year, make it every third of, you know, make it every year. But you've got to be looking at, okay, is my structure right for me where I am at this point in time? All right. So look, that's a bit of a framework. Today's focus is on points number two and three. Um, so having your business and paying yourself first. And then, you know, with what um, Carl and Damien will cover with in terms of the data to build and develop your business. All right, um, look, I could be quoting um, Jeff Bezos or um, Richard Branson. They've both been in the news for various reasons over the last couple of weeks. But I'm going to go back to an Italian artist, uh, sculptor from about 500 years ago. And, and remarkably, it still um, holds true today. So the greater danger for most of us lies not in setting our aim too high and falling short, but in setting our aim too low and not achieving it. And I'm sure, you know, the, the other bit I would add to that is not setting a target at all. All right. So what I want to do today is, is, is talk about getting that target right, which is effectively getting our budget in place. All right. Now, as business owners, we need to be making sure that we're getting our objectives. All right. We understand what our goals and objectives are. So the first thing to do is decide what you are going to receive from your business this year. Okay. So I've just made some numbers up here. These are, these are not your numbers. You need to pick your numbers. Okay. But wages, superannuation, other benefits, and then a profit from your business. The profit from your business is not what's left over. You've got to decide what you want your profit to be at the start of the year. That then drives every single decision you make over the next 365 days. In relation to these things, I want you to, I want you to think about your business in terms of your inputs into your business in terms of two um, factors. One is you deserve a reward for your effort. Okay, and so that's your wages, that's your superannuation. They're the other benefits and you know, FBT, if you like, that you receive from the business. All right. And then you deserve a return on your investment. And that is your profit. Okay. You are an investor in your business. You must get a return. All right. You know, and if you make a loss, that's you putting more money into the business instead of getting a return. Okay. We need, to, we need to decide these things right at the start of the year. Okay, um, I see very, very complicated budgets being put together time and time again. And to that point that you made earlier, David, um, business owners' eyes glaze over, all right? I want you to focus on five numbers, all right? The profit, the fixed expenses of your business, the gross profit, your cost of sales and your sales. Okay, so taking my example figure of $300,000 before, I'm just throwing some numbers together and it's probably a lot smaller than, than many of your businesses. But if you have $300,000 worth of profit, then you add your fixed expenses. Generally, they will be the same from year to year. So that takes us to a required gross profit of $1.3 million. We can then look at the gross profit percentage from your prior year, divide your gross profit by your gross profit percentage. That gives you your sales. Your cost of sales is simply the difference between your sales and your gross profit. Okay, that is your budget. Okay, and it started with your minimum accepted standard of $300,000 there. Okay, then what we want to do is um, invert that, turn it into a more traditional profit and loss. Okay, and then divide it by 12 or divide it by 52, depending on whether you want a monthly budget or a, uh, a weekly budget. And then we want to actually start looking at your actual performance. All right. And don't worry about having pages and pages and pages of detail. That, that's not what this part is about. This part is about getting really clear and really exact about what is required. Okay. In any given month, we want a $25,000 profit. And yes, you have to adjust for seasonality. You have to adjust for growth. I accept all those things. But we want a $25,000 profit in that month. Okay, we only got 17. What's the issue? Okay, um, 
what this number is too high. All right. Now, a business owner needs to focus on asking the right question. Okay. And in this situation, the right question is, why has this number gone up? Okay. And so we would talk to, um, we talked to uh, Kale, uh, sorry, Damien about that, and he would be able to solve the problem. If the problem was that this number wasn't high enough, we talked to Kale about, okay, how can we get a better result from our, from our marketing and getting ourselves out there? But, but really, by keeping these numbers very, very simple, the questions become very, very clear. We're either achieving what we set out to achieve or we're not, and if we're not, ask the great question. Business owners ask great questions. And when you're small, you might have to answer that question. And that's when you go into the, the detail. It, as you start to evolve your business, you'll have others around you that you go and ask the question to and say, right, Fred, how come my cost of sales has increased this, this month? All right, and they go and find out the answer. And that's when they jump into the detail and get the, get the right response for you. All right. So the key points in all of this really are making sure that you start with your goals, start with the end in mind, all right? So if you want a profit of $300,000, you've, um, you've got to make that a reality. Now, I also understand you can't go from, you know, one year making no profit or making a very small profit to the next year making a really large profit. So be careful with your expectations. And if you need to set your goals over a two or three year period to get to where you need to be, then do that, all right? But set a goal, okay? You need to design your result. You need to um, use the summary reporting, that summary budget to generate the right questions. And there's only five or six questions and you just need to ask them at the right time, okay? and then use the data to get the answers. And as I said, Kale for the marketing side of things, Damien for production. And then once you've got the information, determine your actions and then take an action, all right? You need to get on with it. Right, what's the key point in all of this? Profit is mindset and mindset is profit. Your profit is not negotiable. And, and too many times people think that your profit is what's left over. It's, 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 it's not, and it should never be, because if that's the case, you'll never get what you deserve from your business. You've got to pay yourself first, not last. It's not what um, is left over. You need to set your minimum accepted standard. Right? I work damn hard in this business. I take a lot of risk in this business. I'm not going to get paid the least. Okay? Um, so be an investor in your business. How much have you invested? and what is your required rate of return, okay? And, and some business owners would get a, a nasty surprise if they sat down and actually worked out what their business is currently generating. All right, so it's time to drive your results. All right, I'll get back to the, you know, where I started the presentation. How can, in the one industry, you have one business that's performing really profitably and the business owner is really enjoying life, and in the same industry, you can have um, a business owner that's in losses and is feeling really frustrated or disappointed with what's going on. It's all about the mindset. So, so make a decision about what you're going to do. If you're not getting the, re the result that you deserve, we need to talk. Um, so you know, type profit into your chat box now and, and we can start having some conversations around getting the result that you deserve. Awesome. Thanks, Tony. Let's give Tony a nice round of applause. He's covered it well. It's a hard topic. But uh, you know, the thing I love about this, uh, Tony's said the same thing about three times, which is pay yourself first. <clears throat> and I think anyone who knows about Wealth Creation 101, they teach you to put money into your profit account. They say, pay yourself first. Uh, in business, we don't do this. We tend to pay ourselves leftover, as you touched on, Tony. And it's usually because it's the tail wagging the dog. Um, I think, you know, one of the best things about running your own business is you get to choose your own adventure. And for most people, they don't choose. They just hang on for dear life and hope it pays them. Um, the reality of what Tony just said is you need to decide how much you want to make and then it's just a matter of how long it takes to get there. So if you're not doing that kind of planning in your business, so we're not talking about getting one or two extra clients next year, we're not talking about surviving COVID, we're talking about you put your heart and soul into your business. What is the profit that you want to generate as a result of your putting your heart and soul in? And if it takes one year, three years or five years, doesn't really matter. 
the funny thing is if i went to a builder and i said build me a house you know he'd say great we need a plan and you say don't worry just start and you everyone thinks that would be silly right it's illegal to build a house without a plan but it's not illegal to build a business without a plan and how many of us have no plan we just say oh we just want to survive we just want a few more clients we just need to make a bit more money that's ludicrous right you start with an end in mind by deciding how much profit you want to make and if you don't know how to do this just type profit into the chat box now because this is what tony and tag do right they sit there and they say let's work out how to make this business work for you right it's not just about paying tax it's not just about optimizing it's about saying what is your objective because for most of us we do have a lot of investment in our business and i'll give you some rules of thumb one of the things i've learned is if you run your own business you are sacrificing your wage because every one of us who runs a business could be employed, right? Some of us think we're unemployable. And whatever that wage is that you're sacrificing is your opportunity cost, right? So you need to take that into account. You need to take your sweat equity into account. And the rule of thumb for me is three times what I'm worth in the market. So if I'm worth 150 grand as an employee, my business should generate at least 450,000 in profit for me, take home, not gross, net. And if it's not, you're shortchanging yourself. If you're not getting that level of result out of your business, you need to talk to these guys. So what I'm going to ask you to do is just into the chat box right now, if anyone would be interested in having a chat with Tony <clears throat> and finding out, and even just looking at your current financial position, because things have changed since COVID came on board. You know, And if you haven't reviewed your budgets, you haven't reviewed your business target, this is your opportunity to get someone to have a look at it. So just by putting profit into the chat box right now, I'm just going to give you a second to do that, or maybe two. Um, and we're going to do an interesting thing. Um, one of the things that happens with online events like this is it's really hard to meet people. <clears throat> so we're going to go into some breakout rooms, and I'm going to get you to meet some other people on this call. And we're going to break out for a few minutes, but during that time, you're going to meet some new people. You're going to have to answer three questions. Who you are, which should be pretty easy. What you do, which should be pretty easy. But the third one is, what is the one thing that you took away from Tony's presentation? So we're going to put everyone into breakout rooms for a few minutes just to meet some new people, have a bit of a conversation, um, identify what were the key elements that you got from Tony's presentation. Now, Joe, are we ready to do this? Just give me the thumbs up. So this is how it works. To get you into a breakout room, everyone has to do this. Take a deep breath. And we're going to go. One, two, three. Into the breakout rooms. All right. Did you meet some new people? Yep. Yeah, awesome. You're still with us? That's good. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, when, when Tony was on and he talks about this profit thing, I, I used to hate the idea of talking about financials. They used to glaze me over until I realized that that's actually the scorecard for the business. And it's not just about making money. It's about telling me whether my business was healthy. And my accountant said to me, you know, your financials tell you exactly what you need to fix in your business if you know how to read them. And that sort of became interesting because it's like a diagnostic tool. So I think, you know, for most people, they just don't have that visibility. Um, but that's all cool. So into the chat box, just in one word, what was the one thing you got out of Tony's presentation? Just into the chat box. By the way, if you have any questions for the presenters, uh, feel free to put them into the chat box during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer those either during or towards the end of today's presentation. Um, our next presenter, I'm pretty excited about the next one. Um, we talked about these three pillars of business and we talked about the whole collections and getting the money in the door. We want to talk about attraction. Now, attraction is about marketing and sales. Uh, someone asked me this before. Um, and we really need to be thinking in terms of how do we get clients into the business? Now, I've watched some people during COVID who have actually pivoted their businesses very quickly. But to do that, they needed to communicate effectively and fast. I've watched other people that just got a natural boost and I've watched other people who have had to shut their doors. And some of it's tragedy, but the reality is whenever there is a change in an in, in, in economy, it creates opportunity. And for the smart people who actually can anticipate what that change means, they jump on the wave and they grow their business. Understanding how to market your business and how to attract people into your business is a key element of this. And one of the things, and it sounds obvious when I say it, when we say we should be treating our marketing as an investment, not an expense. But what I literally mean by that is if your marketing was generating a profit for you, which means if, I, if you gave me a dollar and I gave you $2 in return, if you gave me a dollar, I gave you $2 in return, how much would you give me? Now, for most people, they say, if I trust you, I give you everything. 
And that's how we should be viewing our marketing. It shouldn't be about how much should I spend on marketing? What's my marketing budget? It should be what's my return on my marketing. So there's no one better to talk about your return on investment on marketing than Smith Brothers Media. Um, we've been working with them for quite a while. Uh, today, we have the privilege of having Cale Duncan, who's one of the tech experts on their team, talking about uh, how we use data-driven profits in our marketing. So I'd like to welcome Cale to the call. Let's give him a nice warm welcome. Cale, you're up. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Let me uh, share screen. Okay, so what I really want to talk about today is embracing marketing data or more specifically how to know that you're doing marketing for the, the right reasons. Um, quick introduction, I'm Cal Duncan, head of marketing at Smith Brothers Media. We believe in, in helping great businesses grow and improve and today specifically want to do so by giving you the tools to, to find and value the most important marketing data and break it down in a way that helps you for all future campaigns, not just any one you're running now. Uh, first thing I wanna do is start with a quick example of analytical inexperience or you know, statistics gone wrong. So to, to set the scene, hypothetically, local council of a, a beach community is tasked with preventing a, a spate of shark attacks on their shore. Being keen but statistically inexperienced the team finds that um, during the same months that the uh, shark attacks go up each year they're also seeing the same increase in uh, local ice cream sales so you know genius they've they found the cause newly emboldened they they promptly shut down all the local ice creameries with you know expectedly ineffective results and while this hypothetical is absurd, the, the statistical data behind it is not too uncommon. We see patterns like this all the time in business, in politics, in scientific research, not just in you know, conflating correlation with causation, but more broadly. It's a, it's a clear cut example of, of data analysis gone awry. You know, people looking at the wrong information or people looking at the right information and drawing the wrong conclusions, or people not looking at the whole picture. At the end of the day, we all need to increase our analytical literacy, knowing better so that we can do better. So how does this all relate to, to marketing? Well, beyond you know maximizing ice cream sales and, and minimizing shark attacks, we need to make sure that marketing campaigns are also data driven. This is going to help us to, to maximize profits. It's also going to help us make more effective refinements, which in turn, you know, help further the profits. It's also why digital campaigns have so much power. Um, with the abundance of data that digital campaign has, we can go so much further than a traditional or offline marketing campaign, if you know how to read that data. This analysis then needs to actually inform decision-making because without that, then decisions are just made for the, the wrong reasons. So what are those wrong reasons? Broadly speaking, every business needs to ask themselves the question, why are we doing this marketing? Because there's a lot of wrong reasons to be running a marketing campaign if you're running anything at all. And I'd wager that, that some of these answers that I go through might be you know, familiar to some people. Uh, we've done it this way for years. Our competitors are doing similar marketing. Uh, we have leftover budget for the year or for the quarter and we want to spend it somewhere. Other people say we have to do marketing or you know, we've run out of other ideas. This can apply broadly to marketing in general and it can also be the reason behind you running a specific campaign or a specific channel or using a specific video in a marketing campaign. All these things are examples of the wrong kinds of reasons to run marketing and without the the, the right ribbon uh, the right reasons aka without that data driven mindset uh, or that focus on analytical literacy then we can't really embrace the full potential of any of any marketing campaign so instead of viewing marketing as an opportunity and as david said as an investment it becomes an obligation something that's done begrudgingly you know if it's done at all uh, it's also 
too easy to, to hand wave the results that you should be demanding from your marketing efforts. And so if you're doing that, of course, they're going to fall short. The other um, problem we get is it's easy to get overwhelmed by the data. We, we don't know where to look exactly with all this data, so we don't look at all. Or we focus only on the smaller tangible results like maximizing reach, maximizing spend, maximizing scale or grandeur. All these things can, can hamper the effectiveness of any campaign. What we need to do is we need to find the right reasons. We need to embrace the real data and the real analysis of that data. And we need to break that data down uh, into chunks we can understand and build up our literacy. Because that, that data is really only going to be valuable to you if you can break it down enough to extract everything of worth. So speaking of, let's break it down. One way we can do that is we start with ROI. <coughs> Return on investment, ROI, is in essence the right reason to do any sort of marketing campaign. We start with ROI as our ultimate goal, then everything else can start flowing backwards from there. Every campaign metric can be thought of in relation to ROI and the user journey towards maximizing that ROI. Now, now what do I mean? For example, average purchase order value. This is directly related to ROI because an increase in the average order value is a direct increase in the amount of revenue you're generating per user. Therefore, the amount of revenue you're generating per investment dollar. Something like ongoing customer retention, increase in the number of transactions per user over their lifetime. Uh, cost per click. Ideally, we want to minimize this as much as possible to get as many users per dollar as possible, therefore as many transactions per dollar as possible. If our ultimate goal is ROI, <coughs> is ROI, then we can maximize that by optimizing all the important metrics leading up to it. But here's the catch. We need to know exactly how those metrics are actually affecting ROI and to what magnitude they're affecting ROI so that we can devote resources to optimizing the correct or most efficient parts of the campaign. But the problem with that is marketing campaigns are segmented if, into different stages of the user journey. And we don't always see how each metric directly relates back to ROI. For example, bounce rate. The, uh, the percentage of users who leave a site after only visiting one page on the website. Sure, we know that decreasing this number might get more users staying longer, thus more conversions, but we have to ask ourselves how important is bounce rate overall? Is it, how much impact is it having on ROI? Is it more important than the ranking position of keywords? Is it more important than a campaign's click-through rate? Which segment of users is being affected by a high bounce rate? Is it all of them? Is it just some of them? We need to, what we need to do is we need to connect all this data to make it work. What we need to do is we need to make a comprehensive user journey. Speaking of, broadly speaking, how a user engages with a business's marketing is broken into the, the following you know, loose stages. Now, I know there's a lot more nuance to all this, but uh, you know, it's useful just to get a few broad segments of a user's journey to help discuss some of these points. First thing we want to talk about is impression. When a user sees some sort of marketing collateral, this is an ad online, a brochure, a flyer, the storefront itself. Moving on to engagement, the user takes the next step and chooses to interact. They click the ad, they enter the store, they open the email. Uh, conversion, they go from a user to a lead. They've provided contact information, they've made a call, they've signed up to a newsletter. Basically, when a user goes from interacting with the marketing to interacting with the business directly. And lastly, sale, turning that contact into revenue. So why are we breaking it down like this? Basically, what we want to do is we want to showcase that each part of this journey has important metrics to track within its own segment and that we should be tracking. Um, and therefore, important optimizations that can be done within those segments. But without a connection between these parts, we can't really tie it back to ROI. For instance, we need to see how changes in the conversion section are affecting sales. We need to see how changes in engagement are affecting conversions. We need to see how changes in impressions 
are, are affecting engagement. And we need to see how changes in, in budgets and campaign targeting and resources affect impressions. We need a fully comprehensive view of user behavior from impression to revenue, because without it, we're just in the dark. I like to think of it as just this black hole of information, this the, you know dark matter that's there, but we can't see anything about it. For example, if we have 100 users going from impression to engagement, and we have 10 of those users going from engagement to conversion, and three of those users going from uh, from conversion to sale, then we absolutely need to see that full journey. Because if we can't see which of those 10 turned into three or which of those 100 turned into 10, then we've just got separate data and we can't reverse engineer it. Because that's at the end of the day, that's the name of the game here is reverse engineering. Finding out where on this complete journey users are falling off, where are they engaging, so you know what parts to focus on and, and what parts of this to, to refine. Are users dropping off when they get to the contact form? Are they refusing to add products to their cart? Are they turned away by the shipping price when they see it? Are we not reaching enough of the target audience in the first place? Or are we failing to entice them to engage in the first place? Are users getting stopped during the final sales process or are we getting the wrong users to that final sales process thus you know hampering our ability to convert once again this is kind of where digital marketing campaigns have the edge we've got tools like google analytics that can provide this sort of comprehensive information about a user's journey on the site and because everything's digital there's a lot more integrations and connections we can connect it to the facebook campaign on one end and see how users are getting there to the site. We can connect it to Salesforce or Pipedrive or WooCommerce on the other end and see how they turn into sales. That's how we build that unbroken user journey. And after that, it's all about just actually looking at the data. And that's really what data-driven marketing is. We wanna see all the way to the end of the journey and that ROI, that ultimate goal, and all the way to the start of the journey. Which marketing efforts are paying dividends and which aren't. One last note before we move on on that part is that comprehensive user journey is also why secondary metrics should not be the sole measure of a campaign's success. For example, ranking improvements, you know, organic visibility is great to see, but you can't pin the whole campaign on its success alone. It's valuable, but only in the way it relates back to ROI. We see which search terms are getting visibility. Therefore, which landing pages from those search terms are getting more traffic and therefore which services based on those landing pages are getting more conversions. By itself though, ranking improvements is not intrinsically valuable. And that's the, that's the thing we need to take away here is these secondary metrics are secondary, not because they are less important abstractly, but that they are just stepping stones to the ultimate metric of ROI. So moving on now, we want to look at the analytics side of things. So from a, from a strategic point of view, how do we think about data analysis beyond just learning the quirks of any one individual platform? It's one thing to, to know we need to connect the data. It's one thing to actually make the technical connections. It's another thing to actually use that journey to make improvements. And, and we see this all the time, really. Businesses have data. Maybe it's comprehensive data, maybe it's not, but there's sometimes some amount of data there. They come looking for the next step. How do I read this correctly? How do I turn it to, advan to my advantage? What do I need to be thinking about when I'm looking at this information? I like to think of it as data is the text and analytics is the, the reading and the, the, the comprehension of that text. And as I said at the top, we just need to be more data literate. So how do we do that? We do that through segmentation and disaggregation. $10 words I know. And in fact, it sort of seems a little counterintuitive because we just spoke about connecting the data and not segmenting it. But what we're actually doing is once we have that comprehensive user journey is we're able to break it up into all the 
slices that we want while knowing that it's all going to connect to that end-to-end -end user journey and therefore connect to that ROI. We're not breaking up that user journey, we're segmenting the different users, we're funneling those users. Um, we're slicing horizontally rather than vertically. More specifically though, we're slicing into effective versus ineffective segments of users. We need to find the good users in this journey. We need to find the bad users. We need to know what the good users have in common. To get more of that, we need to know what the bad users have in common to fix any potholes in the user journey. That's where those um, uh, examples uh, I gave before are useful. The, uh, the 10 users, also the 100 users, the 10 conversions, the three sales. We know right off the bat that those three sales are good users. So with this comprehensive user journey, we can segment out those three users and find out what they have in common with each other and what they don't have in common with the people who aren't converting. Now note, uh, individual user by user breakdowns aren't necessarily the only way or necessarily the most efficient way to segment users. We can do it through larger segments, such as what are the good marketing channels and what are the bad marketing channels? What are the good uh, campaign ad text and what is bad campaign ad text. Because we've got that full user journey, this segmentation is actually useful. So for example, uh, if we're segmenting desktop versus mobile traffic on a website, um, instead of only being able to see 500 users on one hand and 400 users on the other and no other data, what we instead see is their full user journey. From, from one end, we can see how these two segments have different ROIs and therefore different levels of effectiveness. On the other end, we can see how differences in initial campaign targeting or different funnels through the site start sending desktop and mobile traffic down different paths. So we can actually see what's working and what's not in these segments and actually find out where those paths diverge. And really when it comes down to it, that's all that data analysis is. It's collating all the data into one, being able to break it down into good users versus bad, getting more of the good, getting less of the bad. So all this data and analysis and segmentation is done with transparent reporting. So how do we get that? And what do we need to get from our reporting? We need two main things from any marketing campaign reporting. The first is transparency. The only way we can make informed business decisions is to actually be informed. The number one goal of any reporting is to give transparency to the business about the campaign. That means, first and foremost, getting as close to measuring and showing ROI as possible. Now, not every one single system is automatically going to connect from impression to revenue, but for the parts of the user journey that any one report does cover, we need to get as close to ROI as possible. If we can't show ROI, for instance, if that last step might need to come from an internal business report, then it needs to show cost per conversion. If we can't show cost per conversion, it needs to show engagement. It needs to get as close to that ROI as possible. And an ideal way to get that transparent reporting is through self-directed reporting. Giving you direct access to the raw data, not limiting how you see it or when you can see it. The freedom to to see all the relevant info is, is key to transparent reporting. Things like uh, collated dashboards are great for this because you can stuff a whole lot of different data sources into one place. It's easy to use and holistic instead of going four different places to see ranking analytics AdWords data, it's all in one spot. Second main thing any reporting needs is context. We also need more than just the raw data. We need to get working with an agency, working with your staff, outside consultants, that sort of thing. No matter how you do it, it's ideal if you pair self-directed reporting with this context-rich reporting. Just to, to go over a quick summary, uh, main points that we talked through were um, many businesses go into marketing for the wrong reasons because we're looking at campaigns through those, the lens of those wrong reasons, campaigns can't be maximized and ROI can't be maximized. ROI, that ultimate goal is, is most effective if it's connected through the whole user journey. And when we take that comprehensive data and we optimize the campaign through effective segmentation, then we can find the good users and the bad. And we need to do all that 
through a pairing of transparent and context-rich reporting. So in conclusion, um, if you're not really getting the, the ROI that you should be demanding from your marketing, or if you're not getting the clarity that you need from your marketing, go ahead, type discovery into the chat. We can book a business discovery session, potentially help get more transparency on your data or just help with analyzing effective paths forward for a marketing campaign. Um, and lastly, just want to thank everyone for your time today. Really hope it's been valuable. Thanks so much. Awesome. Let's give Kyle a nice uh, round of applause. That was technical. I love it. Uh, here's the funny thing, right? We, we've had two presenters that have talked very technically about numbers in our business. Um, the way I interpret this is we need a dashboard. And in our business, we need to know what's working, what's not working. We need to know when to hit the accelerator, when to hit the brake. We need to know how much, not how much fuel's left in the tank, but how many kilometers we have left till we need to fill up. And having this sort of data that these guys have been talking about is literally about doing that. So if anyone really hasn't hit the accelerator on their marketing because they're not sure of their return, they need to be talking to people like Smith Brothers. I think putting discovery into the chat box now is the way that you get Kyle to reach out. Um, I know that one of the things I will do first is, uh, and I demand this of any marketing company I ever use, is I say, show me the money. I need to see return. I need to see the numbers and I need to know what my investment is going to be and when should I see a return on my marketing investment. So if you're not there yet and you have to um, really be tentative with your marketing spend, and this is the symptoms, your marketing budget is the least amount possible. If your marketing budget is the most amount possible, then you know what your return on investment is. Um, and it should be tied to one thing. It should be tied to capacity. So um, we're going to go into a breakout room. What we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna put you in with some random people. It might be the same or different as last time. Uh, this time it's the same sort of message. Um, what we're gonna do is introduce yourself to the people who you are, what you do, what were the key elements that you took away from Kale's presentation. Um, we're gonna break you out for about uh, eight minutes, Joe, is that right? Yep, so on the count of three, we're gonna take a deep breath and we're gonna go into the breakout rooms. One, two, and <gasps> Three. Like everyone's come back. So hopefully you met some new people during that uh, breakout. Uh, what I'd like you to do, just into the chat box, uh, what were the key takeaways that you got out of uh, Kale's presentation? Just in one word or two words, what were the key elements? Uh, what did you learn? What did he remind you of? Um, for me, it was pretty simple. I mean, Kale basically said everything's measurable and one number doesn't necessarily tell the truth. And I'm certainly going to close my ice cream store if I get a shark attack. I get it um but it sounded ironic but it's actually so true so many people say oh we've tried facebook and it didn't work and you go what do you mean you tried facebook well we put an ad up well, what did you measure so having the metrics for each stage definitely um linking roi measurement to marketing i love it um for me it's exciting when you do that because what it does is it allows you to sort of turn the volume up on the business because i think you know when tony talked about profit a bit earlier uh, profitability of a business is an interesting thing because we only make high profits after we hit our break-even point. And for most people, they go like at the clappers to get to break-even because they need to pay their bills. But when it comes to making a profit, it's optional. So they go, hey, we're making enough. He's got his hand way up in the air. He's going to say something. Can I, can I just jump in that? That's a really good point. People are really happy to move away from pain. Yeah. But... but do they strive to actually achieve excellence? And yeah, and yeah. people work as, as hard once they get to the break even point to move, you know, to move up, um, fantastic things will be achieved. So yeah, I, I, you're hundred percent spot on. So I appreciate that time. So um, yeah, we've got a few good, uh, don't get attacked by sharks, have some ice cream instead. I love it. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about, you know, what, what, what's the sort of story behind all this? You know, most people I meet in business are in chaos. And what I mean by that is they go to work every day and they just work on survival, which is exactly what we just talked about. They make enough money to pay the bills, but they don't make the profit. And the reason they don't is they run out of time. They're just too busy. They're exhausted. And, you know, there's this theory of if I don't pay my rent, they close the doors. If I don't pay the tax man, he shuts me down. If I don't pay my employees, they go. If I don't pay myself, well, that's called sweat equity. And that's all what business building is all about. It's not true. It's not true. This is all about understanding that you need to get out of chaos before you go into growth. So to me, the next stage after getting out of chaos is going into growth. And what Kale talked about there was the first element of growth, which is how do I get new clients when I need them? I don't want to wait till I get a referral or word of mouth. I've got capacity in my business. 
I need to turn up the volume on my marketing and I'm going to see my return on investment straight away. The third element of, uh, there's a second element to growth, which I'm pretty excited about, which is our next presenter, which is Damien Lacey, we're going to be talking a bit about. And um, what he's going to be talking about is that, uh, going back a couple of slides, is the delivery side. Now, the reason this gets me excited is that when you have a client who's already doing business with you, the quickest way to turn a profit is to make sure you manage costs. Tony touched on this, but for most people, they don't understand how to manage their delivery. So when I met Damien a few years back and he talked about you know, um, lean um, manufacturing and he talked about the process improvement within organizations, it was dear to my heart because as a business coach, I'm a big fan of this. I think that most people, they're very inefficient in their delivery and they justify it by saying we're serving our customers. We want to make sure that they stay. So we over-service them. And for me, the biggest risk with working with customers is over-servicing them and not making a profit. So uh, if you'd like to welcome Damien Lacey from OE Partners, he's going to be talking about how you can leverage data to make sure that you've got productivity growth in your operation. So let's give Damien a nice warm welcome. Over to you, Damien. Great. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank, thanks, David and the Outcomes Business Group um, for the opportunity to be able to speak to you all today. So yeah, I'll be talking about how to leverage data to achieve game-changing productivity growth from, from your operations. Um, we we'll start with a little bit of context, a little bit of an introduction. Um, so I'm the founder of OE Partners. OE stands for Operational Excellence. And we work with clients, um, generally SMEs, um, to help them unlock the productivity of their operations. And we do this by applying lean business uh, methods, running lean transformation programs, that sort of things. And, and data is absolutely central um, to our, our programs uh, and what we do. So I myself began working with lean and uh, lean transformation programs about 2002, 2003. I joined uh, an automotive supplier called Robert Bosch um, at that time. The, the company was just beginning its lean journey. Um, and, you know, I was really, you know, it really left an impression on me. The the big, the massive change uh, that is possible when companies effectively apply lean principles to their operations. Um, and I've kind of been hooked ever since. Uh, Toyota is, a, um, is one of the, the main sources of these lean methods and, and tools. And so I was keen to learn from the source. I spent, so I joined Toyota Australia in the product development team. A lot of time spent on cost reduction for products, for processes, uh, we sent to Japan, uh, the head office for, for almost three years and, you know, really good experience to not just learn the technical aspects, but also to really see firsthand a company that's living and breathing these principles. Um, came back to Australia, automotive industry wound up pretty much before our very eyes and started to start, decided to start consulting to uh, Australian businesses uh, on lean and operational excellence. That led me to form OE Partners. It's been six years now. We've grown a team of seven. Look, working with a range of businesses, but probably majority are SMEs, um, and they're either making a product or moving a product. So manufacturing, construction, warehousing, distribution, uh, that kind of thing. So that's a little bit about us, and let's get into the presentation. So I thought it would be useful to just hear from you guys in terms of how experienced you are with, with lean principles and methods. And maybe if you just give us a, a red, yellow, or a green in the chat box in terms of your experience and familiarity. So red is, you know, you don't have a lot of experience, but you're keen to learn more. Yellow, some, and green, yeah, a lot of experience. Okay, it's a good, good mix of responses coming through there. Some reds. Uh, an orange. Monica, you put yourself as a red. I don't know about that. I've, I've seen some of the work that you've done there, Monica. I wouldn't say it's a red, just between the two of us. Um, yeah, look, good range of experience there. Some really experienced proponents, um, you know, all the way from Jim Glover from, from Busy. Definitely would you be a solid green there, Jim, I would say. <laughs> Thanks, mate. No worries. Um, very good. So, Today's session, now we don't have time to go into all of the different facets and tools and methods, but what I am going to talk to you about is a really powerful tool that, you know, leading organizations um, use 
to drive tremendous productivity growth uh, in their operations. And that tool is called Value Stream Mapping. Um, and it really allows business, average businesses to get to that next level and generate super profits. Because really, and I use that word specifically because a business that's operating with operational excellence methods, really lean systems and processes, they are super profitable compared to your average business. You know, um, and a key tool that they use to uh, unlock that productivity is uh, value stream mapping. So, um, you know, you can you can find yourself in the in the situation where, you know, um, each day is similar to the one before. And you can put it down to, well, look, we don't have the time to implement big changes and therefore we don't see big, big differences in the way we operate. Now, I would challenge that. Uh, and I'd say that a lot of time uh, businesses spend, uh, you know, the, the, the time gets spread too thin um, and they're trying to do too many things at once. And so you don't necessarily uh, put the time into the best initiatives for change. So, I mean, we could run a, a brainstorming session with your team, right? And come up with 20 different ideas to improve uh, your business, but not all of those will deliver a benefit to the bottom line, uh, at least not straight away. And in fact, most of them won't. And so, you know, why is that? Because we're not aligning that change to where the business is really crying out for the help, you know, where it's being constrained. So firstly, value stream mapping, what is it? It's a one page representation of all of the processes uh, required to create and deliver value for your customers on, on one piece of paper, if you like, or one page. And it looks at the entire organization, right? Uh, and everything that happens on the value creation chain. Um, so from the mo moment when your order is placed with your customers until it is uh, delivered and paid for. And it maps out all of the important process steps. And um, more importantly, it looks at the, perf the performance data. And data is really what brings a value stream map to life and tells you what's really what's really happening, what's really going on. Um, and th the focus is really on the end-to-end -end flow and identifies anything that interrupts that flow because ev eventually that flow is going to turn into, you know, that physical product flow or that service delivery flow is going to translate into cash flow, uh, as David and Tony were talking about, and making sure that that is uninterrupted. So, yeah, we're looking at for those macro uh, sources of waste and interruption. So that's what it is in a, in a simple overview. Now, the goal of any value stream mapping uh, exercise is not to produce a, group, a beautiful piece of analysis, but it's to identify the sources of waste in the value chain and to eliminate them. That's what we want to do. This is a tool to give us an opportunity to do that. But let's talk about waste. What, what does waste mean? Um, you know, what's wasteful, what's useful? So like anything, it helps to categorize things. Um, so we can look at any activity in an organization. Um, it's, uh, it can be categorized in three, three ways, right? It's either value adding, it's directly related to creating the product or delivering the service that a customer pays for, or it's part of your business's delivery requirements, uh, your business requirements. Um, so, you know, you've got to do it to run the business, but to be honest, the customer doesn't really care about it. So, you know, planning a delivery schedule, recruiting a new team member, um, paying your tax, you know, you have to do it, but the customer really doesn't want to know about it. And then there's finally the pure waste. So things like mistakes, errors, scrap, write-off, th those sorts of things. Um, to explain it quickly, if we were to take the example of, uh, you know, a business that we're all familiar with, a cafe, right? The value-adding steps in that, Cafe are things like heating the milk, adding the sugar to the cup, stirring, putting the lid on, delivering it to your hand. These are all things that you get value from, you're willing to pay for. Um, business requirements would be things like ringing the supplier, um, arranging uh, next week's roster, things like that. And, and pure waste would be, you know, we've got the order wrong. Uh, we've spilled the sugar. We've had to stop and repair the the coffee machine because it was broken. Those things shouldn't happen, right? Um, so they, they're pure waste and should be eliminated. Now, I'm sure this isn't gonna come as, uh, you know, earth shattering, but uh, picking up on what Tony was saying earlier, um, to improve the profitability of your organization, you can do two things, right? It's really simple. You can either increase your sales or you can reduce your costs. Um, now, the beauty about 
eliminating waste um, and reducing the amount of time we spend on business requirements is that it can do two things. It can help us reduce costs. So let's say a job took us eight hours to deliver. Now we're doing it in four. So that's less labor cost per job done. That's a win. But also we've got that capacity, which allows us then to process the next order and improve productivity, improve our revenue. So the wonderful thing uh, about waste elimination is it allows us to help both sides um, or both factors in that profit e equation. Very good. Now, uh, another uh, commonly shocking statistic is that when we go through the value stream mapping exercise and add up all of that activity that happens within a business from when the order is placed to uh, when the delivery is, is uh, fulfilled, on average, about 5% of the activity in an organization is actually value adding, right? I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna repeat that, okay? On average, only 5% of the activity, the time spent in an organization is actually value adding, directly related to creating and delivering the product or service for a customer. The rest of it is either business requirements or it's completely wasteful altogether. Now that can be uh, that can be surprising, but it's absolutely true, and we see this time and time again when we do uh, these value stream mapping exercises. And so, if you're sort of thinking, you know, or if you've got members of your team uh, who are thinking that you know what we're pretty good, we're pretty efficient, uh, I don't I don't think there's that much uh, room for improvement. Chances are that. You know, they've just become blind to it. They've assumed that this is the, the only way and the, the normal way of working. When in actual fact, there's lots and lots of opportunities. So, you know, I'll go through a couple of examples now. Um, we're not talking about one and two percent here. We're talking about big uh, differences in, in cost and productivity uh, that, are pro that are possible um, through the, uh, these ideas. Very good. So, Let's talk about how value stream mapping is used to help businesses. So I'm going to run through a quick case study um, from one of our clients. Uh, we were engaged to help uh, one of all Steel's distribution centers. Now they weren't able to keep up with deliveries. Customers were unhappy. Um, you know, costs were, were quite high for the business. Um, and, you know, it, it was a, a combination of manual labor and automation. It ran... It ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Customer demand is constantly changing. Um, you had the seasonal factors in there um, that made it sort of hard to gain an understanding of what was going on. And also from shift to shift, they did different tasks. So, um, you know, there was lots of different theories about what might be causing the issues within the, within the facility. Because it was so dynamic, um, you know, it was really hard to see and only incremental change had been made. So the really beneficial outcome of uh, value stream mapping and the data analysis was that we, in this instance, we discovered that in pretty much the in productivity of the entire organization was getting constrained at one or of two picking stations, right? So I think it was picking station number two, um, I think it was. Material, um, you know, material wasn't being supplied properly properly to that station. Uh, the operator was sometimes, uh, you know, asked to get to help with unloading the truck. Um, you know, the go away on breaks, the machine, the, the process would stop. Um, we'd run slow, we'd run uh, faster, depending on who was running it. And there was no, there was no sense of urgency. You know, no focus on that that station. It was just one of many, so you know, no, no big deal, right? But in actual fact. As I said, the, the productivity was of the entire organization was getting constrained there. That was the pace setter of the, of the business. Now, once we knew that, we had some really good data to tell us that, okay, that changed everything, obviously. This process can never stop. We've got to make sure it's always supplied with material. No one will ask Joe uh, on that station to go help him with anything. Um, if someone wants to go on a break, they need to be right there to replace. We need to streamline and define clearly what's the best way to run this process. Um, and so after that uh, process of making targeted improvements and fixing all of the inefficiencies, 
you know, there was a, a, a really clear and significant increase in productivity. Um, so the results are pretty significant. It, the delivery performance improved by 30%, labor requirements actually dropped by 27% across the entire organization. Um, so yeah, in that instance, confirming where the constraints are were really, really important. Now, the second thing that value stream mapping can allow you to do and the data that it brings to, to in front of you is that it allows you to uncover huge amounts of waste and inefficiency. Now, this was um, a, a different example, not so much around finding one particular point in the chain. It was really just getting clarity on the end to end and seeing the overall amount of waste and inefficiency. This was um, some work we did with a, a prefab building product manufacturer. Um, you know, they would do a lot of work with tenders. They would get a large volume, but the price was fixed and they had to deliver it uh, to that price. Now, unfortunately, um, this particular product was actually losing money. Um, so as awful as it sounds, the more they sold, the more they lost um, on, on the product. Now, they'd sort of forgiven that situation by saying it's, it's a loss leader for other things, but in actual fact, they were losing money every time they, they pushed one out the door. So in this instance, um, the value stream mapping wasn't so much about pinpointing a bottleneck, but really just looking at, well, this process needs to be completely redesigned. Um, you know, really um, re-engineering the process, um, getting rid of inefficiencies, labor imbalances, smarter ways of working. And the results were really, really significant. This is, I mean, not about sort of finding ones and two percents here, but really um, you know, the lead time, it used to take them 40 hours once an order went in to the system until it was completed. So 40 hours, they're doing lots of things in batches. So they do sort of 10 or 15 at a time. We got that down, uh, you know, the client uh, got that down to two hours um, so the labor requirements, that wasn't because we just threw more labor at it. Labor requirements actually uh, reduced by 25%. And naturally output up, uh, increased um, and they started to make money on the buildings again. So that was a, a really clear example of um, bringing data to bear, bringing analysis to bear and, and having it equate into uh, direct profits. Okay, so um, that is a quick introduction to the tool and some examples to hopefully get you interested, get you thinking about applying these results, these methods to your organization. And as I said, it's not about ones and twos, it's more, more significant than that. Um, so if you've got a sense that maybe your operation isn't running as effectively as it should be, or you know, you're making improvements, but it's not happening as fast as you'd like, um, then, you know, there would there's a potential for profits to be um, sitting there unlocked within your business. Um, lean organizations, pick a, pick a company that you admire, uh, could be Procter & Gamble or Boeing or Toyota or whoever, they do this for a reason because it makes them more profitable, right? Um, so if you, uh, you're looking to get some advice um, or some help with this uh, area, generally we would start with a phone call. Um, we may be able to help, we may not be able to help, but generally the first place to start is to, um, to have a phone call. So um, if you're interested in that, type in yes in, in the chat box, we can, we can have that initial discussion. Um, generally what we do is get an understanding of your current state, go through a simple operational analysis and maybe suggest some steps from there. Um, so as I said, if you are interested in that, go ahead and type um, yes in the chat box. And there also is federal support, federal government support related to this kind of initiative. They're always keen to boost productivity. Um, there's a great um, grant program called the Entrepreneurs Program, which I'd heartily recommend for any part of your business, but also our customers you know, regularly uh, use this as well. So as I said, uh, if that's of interest, either direct message me uh, or uh, type in chat box, uh, yes. So uh, thanks for your, for your time. And awesome. uh, yeah, look forward to talking to you soon. Let's give Damien a round of applause. Some awesome information. Um, I love this whole idea of, you know, looking at the process because sometimes we work harder and not smarter. And we think the answer to our problems is get more clients. And the reality is it's not, it's about become more profitable. But if we don't know about waste, and I hear this all the time, people say to me, you know, we're working as hard as we can, we're flat out. And the reality is they're doing things the old way. 
So look, as we start wrapping up, I want you to, there's a couple of messages that I'd like to sort of convey to you. We've talked about a couple of stages in business. The first one is really, you know, you've got to get above the noise. You've got to get out of the chaos and you've started start to take control. The way to do that is to have a dashboard on all of these areas. We've talked about three different areas in business. By the way, during the break, someone asked me if they could get a copy of the slides from all of the presenters. If you're interested in getting the slides from the presenters, just touch slides into the chat box now, uh, slides into the chat box, and we're happy to sort of furnish you with a copy of all of those slides. Um, someone also asked about recordings. Uh, we will be endeavoring to send a recording, but if you're brave enough to watch two hours of uh, rerun, that's great. Uh, the reality is the slides is the summary. So if you want the slides, type in slides. Um, we can make sure that you get those from all the presenters. There's some great content here today. And I know for most of us, you know, we've been forced into a situation to sit around and just postulate and think about the future for the next few weeks, um, which is fine. Um, but let's talk about what happens next. So we get out of chaos, we move into control, then we grow. We grow by getting new clients, we grow by making sure that they're paying their bills. And the last point that most people I never see get to very rarely in business is getting into a point of leverage. Now, what I mean by leverage in business is that you are now not working in the business, you're working on the business. You actually have the time to strategize because for some people, this whole COVID experience has been an awesome opportunity to grow their business. It's given them the space, it's given them the time, it's, uh, it's made them pivot. And for other people, they're just hanging on for dear life and hoping that things go away. There's a couple of sayings that, that are really dear to my heart. And the first one is from this fellow, uh, Jim Rohn. I don't know if anyone knows Jim Rohn on the call, just to show of hands for those people who have heard that name before. Um, I read his book when I first started, when I was about, uh, when I first started in business, even earlier than that. And my favorite saying was this one, never wish life were easier, wish you were better. Because we can't control external circumstances. We cannot, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. All we do know is that I can control what you learn and what you want and what you do differently. So never wish life were easy, wish you were better. And my second favorite philosophy comes from this guy. Yes, Bruce Lee, famous business philosopher. And he said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. And what, he, what I interpret out of that is simple. You can sit here and learn all this stuff and go, yeah, yeah, I've heard about lean before. Yes, yes, I know about uh, you know, profit first. But if you don't apply the knowledge from today, if you don't take the lessons from today and turn them into action items, the chances of success are super, super low. Um, so they've got a couple of things that I want you to do. Um, what I'd like you to do before we leave today's call, I am a business coach by very nature. One of my things I need to get you to do is to take away some action items. So can you just split, spend a couple of minutes now reviewing any notes that you took? What were the key elements that you got out of today's presentation? What are the takeaways or action items? What are you going to do differently as a result of today's presentation? I just want you to jot down the top three action items that you will take as a result of today's presentation. We've invested nearly two hours together today. We've had some compelling presenters talking about, you know, understanding your finances and optimizing your profitability, understanding your marketing and optimizing your return on investment, and understanding where is the waste in your production. What are the key action items that you're going to take as a result of today's presentation? Just jot down your top three. And once you've done that, I want you to circle the most important one. And then I want you to put it into the chat box so we can see what you got out of today's session. So into the chat box, what are the key elements? What are the key takeaways? Or what is the key thing that you're going to do differently as a result of today? While you guys are doing that, I will uh, talk a bit about our organization and what we do. Um, we've just started a financial year. And for a lot of people, they should have done their budget. It should have been ticked off. If you had Tony as your accountant, it would have been done non-negotiably by the end of June. Um, but for a lot of people, their planning is substandard. And what I mean by that is they don't have a structured approach or they don't have a third party looking at their business plan. We run a thing called the Business, the business Accelerator Plan. It's a roundtable event. It is online, but it's a roundtable event. Um, we've got the next one coming up next Thursday, the 5th at 9 a.m., it's normally a hundred bucks to go to this event, but because you guys are on this call and if you're interested in coming to the accelerator plan, the business acceleration plan, um, you just need to type in accelerate in the chat box and we'll organize a complimentary ticket for you. It's two hours. I run it. It's an interactive workshop. So if anyone's interested in building a plan that's guaranteed to get your results, um, join us for the business acceleration plan on the, on the fifth. First thing is you need to be available. It is on zoom. Um, second thing is there's no cost. If you just type in acceleration into the chat box, we can get you in there as well. I want to go through some of the lessons. Let's, let's work out what people got. And also, by the way, if you have any questions for the presenters, now's your chance. Um, a couple of, a bit of the feedback. So um, 
goals, marketing, and budget, targeting profit for profitability first. This is ironic, right? Uh, most people, profit is a leftover. And for me, profit should be the thing that you go into business for, okay? And unless you stipulate it as non-negotiable, it becomes something that's left to the end. Um, start with how much profit you want to make. Uh, thanks, Ian. Uh, look at the slides over the weekend <laughs> and then an an analyze what to do next. Awesome. Um, data isn't overwhelming when you break it down. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, step aside and assess, plan and manage time. See, to me, very few people spend that time assessing what they should be doing next. So thanks, Andrew. Open discussion with Damien in waste. You know, waste is terrible in business and people call it busyness when it should be business, right? Um, acceleration, yeah, okay, so I've got a few people want to come to the accelerator plan. Uh, keep learning and applying every day, 100%. I mean, the guys today have shared some awesome intellectual property information about what you can do. You can get them to help you. You don't need to. You can actually take the, the ideas they've come up with and, and implement them yourself. Um, the good thing about the guys on the call today, they're very generous with their time. And they're also, I've known most of these guys, I've known all these guys for a long time. And uh, we don't get them on the call just because uh, we want to get people on the call. We get them on the call because they know what they're doing. And usually in their first conversation you, with you, I guarantee you, I know Damien will do it. I know Tony will do it. And I know for sure that the Smith Brothers guys will do it. Within 15 minutes, they'll work out whether they can help you or not. And I think they're pretty honest about whether they can't because I think, you know, time's one of our most valuable assets. And, you know, spending time with people trying to sell you something you don't want is not good. Spending 15 minutes on a phone conversation to assess whether someone can help you is ideal. Um, finish our product line to stop inefficiencies. Thanks, Wendy. Um, VSM, focus on identifying elim and eliminating waste and re-engineering of processes, 100%. Um, Blair, remove, move, move myself from the day-to-day -day build of the business, pay myself first and develop yourself every day, set time aside. Brilliant. Um, waste management, I love that one. Um, Simon, uh, review progress and previous work on business excellence. Great. Um, Re-review profit targets. And uh, don't, don't kid yourself, you know, you are in business to make a profit and it's not about being greedy. That's the scorecard that tells you whether your business is contributing value to, to your client base. And sometimes we get confused and we say, you know, pro we don't want to make too much profit. We're not for profit. Well, profit's what means you can open the doors tomorrow. You know, Tony touched on something very loosely. He talked about having this um, war chest or the buffer account. And I know a few of our comments, we said, if you get any money from the government for COVID, stick it in your war chest have this buffer account, you should have two to three months of expenses just sitting there in cash. Because sometimes when these events occur, there's some great opportunities right in front of you. And in your industry, I don't know if it's going to work for you. Some of you guys will have competitors that are failing at the moment. And they've got two things that you want, clients and employees. So don't be narrow-minded about what's going on right now. There's opportunities in every industry. I'm yet to see an industry where there isn't people that are making inroads. Um, but I also see the other side of that too. So if there, if there are any questions for the presenters, now's your chance. We've got a couple of minutes up our sleeves before we leave you guys to go and look after kids and do whatever you have to do, make your cup of tea. Um, it looks like most people have got what they needed out today. Has it been useful? Give me a thumbs up if you got value out of today. Yeah. Look, uh, I really appreciate your time and attention. It uh, is quite difficult to sit down for two hours in a row, but uh, by mixing it up and getting different calibers of presenters, I'm hoping you learned a lot about what you can do to improve your business. Um, feel free to reach out to any of these guys. Um, I know they're all super friendly. Um, we're going to take, we've got some notes of people who want the slides. We'll make sure we get those out to you as well. Um, uh, maybe uh, unmute yourself and uh, thank our presenters for an awesome job today. Why don't we Thanks, do that? everyone. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thanks all. Enjoy the rest of your day, guys. And enjoy the rest of the lockdown if you're in it.